Welcome back River Valley Church. Just by way of introduction, my name is Zeus and today we're talking about holding nothing back when it comes to forgiveness. Now, here's the thing, before we go any further, let's just be honest, forgiveness, it is hard. It is probably one of the most challenging things. At least I've seen that happen in my life. And in fact, I would, I would also think that you probably would not even disagree with that statement. In fact, even psychologists would tell us that forgiveness is a conscientious, deliberate decision to be able to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or a group of people that has harmed you. And again, here's a key part, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness or not. You see, offense, resentment, or just this, again, unforgiveness, it harbors a lot of feelings and it gets us into a vicious cycle. And if we're not careful, we can allow this very thing to shipwreck us and get us to a place of really robbing us from the life that we were meant to live in Jesus. And I think what it says in Ephesians chapter four, verse 31, and this is really good, and it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as we, as well as all types of behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Now, for me, as I've looked through this, I've been thinking, like, what are the stories in the Bible? Because we know that throughout the Bible, this theme of unforgiveness and the thing of really forgiveness is evident all over the place. In fact, I would even say it is one of these subterranean pillars that we need to exercise in our life to be able to live a vibrant life. And as I dig through the Bible, I think of the story of Joseph. Joseph is a son of Jacob. And if you've never read the story, I would encourage you to go back and look at it because it is one of the, I believe it, it needs to be in the Mount Rushmore of Bible stories. But it's really cool because uh, Joseph very quickly becomes Jacob's, one of Jacob's son. In fact, his favorite son, I would say. And here's the interesting thing is that Jacob actually had older children, older sons. And in custom, uh, the older son would actually be the heir apparent, if you will, to the family business. But in this particular case, Joseph was considered to be the favorite. Now, I know what you're thinking, okay? We've all been there, whether you're a parent or if you've been a sibling. That question, who is the favorite? Uh, who's the one? Are you the favorite? All this. But here, Jacob made no mistake about it. It was Joseph. In fact, at one point, Jacob gifts his son Joseph this incredible robe, this very special robe. In fact, it was colorful, had all sorts of uh, different uh, textures and actually soft textures, very different from what everyone else would get. And what that signified, it was kind of a, a stake in the ground moment where it showed to the rest of his brothers that he is the favorite, that he is the one. And so as you can imagine, this sent their brothers into kind of a little bit of a tailspin. Like, what do we make of this? What do we think about this? And, and Joseph was very gifted. He was. And in fact, God gave him amazing gifts and talents. And one of those was to have dreams and to be able to interpret dreams. And the thing about this is that at one moment, at a different moments, actually, he had dreams and he would share those dreams with his brothers. And well, again, already harboring some jealousy, some resentment, they didn't like that. And so at one point throughout the story, you find Joseph being asked by Jacob to go check up on his brothers. The brothers are out somewhere, um, just a far distance away, but his dad says, hey, go check up on your brothers, see how they're doing. And so on his way, his brothers notice that he's coming. And his brothers have a decision to make in that very moment. What do we do? This is our moment, right? This, like, if we wanted to get rid of this guy, this is our time. And so we have two choices, essentially, in that moment the brothers did. Number one was you completely kill him and kind of end the story. And you go back to Jacob and say, hey, he's gone. I'm sorry to tell you. Or you keep him alive, but you said he's been killed. And that's what they ended up doing. They ended up stripping him. They ended up taking things away from him. They, they stripped him of this robe that was given to him. And in fact, instead of uh, killing him, he was sell, sold to a caravan of people on their way to Egypt. And again, there's a lot more that happens to the story. The brothers go back. They tell his dad, hey, I'm sorry to tell you, Joseph is gone. And so they kind of move on. And, and Joseph, as a teenager, goes through this, this journey of just finding himself to becoming the number two in one of the greatest kingdoms that this history has ever known. And that is a kingdom in, the, in the, the empire of Egypt. And he becomes number two to only Pharaoh. And Pharaoh gives him the, uh, the, the responsibility to be able to uh, manage the resources of this empire. And so as you can imagine, as, as things happen, uh, people come, came to Joseph. And one of those moments were when this, the, the land went through a terrible famine, okay, people, were starving, people needed food, people needed resources. So what did they do? Well, they got to go to Egypt. They got to go and petition and see if there's any sort of relief. And so that they do. And, and some of those people were, as you know it, his brothers. And so here we have it. This, this whole story has now come full circle. 
And Joseph initially uh, recognizes them, but they don't recognize him because for all they know, he's, he's gone. He's no longer a thing. He doesn't exist. And Joseph has a, a moment, an opportunity right there to make a decision. Do I, uh, do, I, do I do what I feel is best and kind of just do what I want? Or do I offer some sort of relief? And because, again, Joseph knew what he was about. And so to me, when I think of this story, when I think of all this, and first off, I say, well, Joseph exercised a lot of patience. Because, again, if you're asking me, if you're asking what I would do, I mean, like, I'm thinking this is my opportunity. I'm going to stake my claim. I'm going to stake my, you know, like, this is what I'm going to do. But we also know that when you live a life in Jesus, that's not always the case. And so I, I came up with three truths of just different things that we can take away, whether it be in our discussion here later on with our groups or whether you're at home watching it by yourself. But three takeaways that I believe that we can learn from this. And I think number one is this. The first takeaway is that forgiveness is a command. It's not a choice. Okay, it's a command, not a choice. We, we could succumb to live as a victim or we can get to a place where we accept responsibility to what we know is true. To be able to receive the full measure of a life that is full and vibrant through God. And so we know this. Uh, even in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus, later on in the narrative, uh, Jesus comes into the picture and he's talking and Peter asks him a question. He says to them, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I be able to forgive him? And he says up to seven times. But then Jesus says, no, 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 not just seven times. He says, I do not say you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. In other words, to be able to forgive without end. And some people would even argue and say, even without reason. See, Joseph was justified by his emotions, by his standards of the world, but Jesus and how he lived taught us to live in a different way. What's the other point? Well, the other point is Jesus himself. Jesus modeled forgiveness. After all, we are called to live like Jesus and to model the way that Jesus left, uh, the example that he left for us. The story of Joseph, in fact, I would tell you, has tremendous parallels to that of the story of Jesus, but let's not mistake it, okay? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? And, but Joseph, there was, there's a lot of different things that happened where he was stripped, he was taken, and ultimately left for dead. But we also know that the story did not end there. But unlike, but so in John chapter 3, verse 16, it also says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That he loved the whole world that he gave his only son. And when we're going through this, we're saying, hold nothing back on forgiveness. I really believe that God did not hold anything back, and neither did Jesus, so much so that he would give his life. He would show us that even up to the point of, of the crucifixion, he is hanging on the cross. He says to the people around him, says, Father, forgive them, for they not know what they do. Jesus modeled it for us. And so, of course, we're called to live like Jesus. And then the last point, the one that, I, the, the, the one that, that, that actually brings me a lot of comfort as well, is that God is sovereign. That God is in that, that perhaps uh, Jacob taught Joseph the prophecy spoken to his great-grandfather, Abraham. In other words, in Genesis chapter 15, it says, then God said to Abram, this is before the story, of course, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and we will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years, and the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. I gotta wonder, and I gotta think, that Joseph understood that there was a bigger plan in place. Because again, I don't know if you've ever been to a situation. I don't know if you've ever been through heartache or, or heartbreak or, or, or some sort of loss where you've dealt with this idea, this concept, this principle of forgiveness. But Joseph knew, understood. It's like, maybe there's something else that is going on here. Did, maybe, did, did he sit back? Did he think what life could have been? Probably. But Joseph knew that God was sovereign and that God was in it through it all. And that was his comfort because that was the design for his life. Now, as we begin to close here, I would tell you this. I don't know what your story is like. Probably as you begin to think right now, you're thinking of maybe someone that you need to forgive or maybe someone that you've been waiting for their forgiveness. But whatever it is, I would just encourage you that you would act upon that because I believe that that is the Holy Spirit right now working in your life. You know, I look at my own personal life. I look at my own story and I'm not afraid to share, but back when I was 12 years old, um, our family was in a tailspin. My dad made a lot of choices that were very detrimental and destructive to our family. Now, I'm happy to say that things have changed and my dad has come around, but it was, it was a really painful time in my life, the hardest time of my life. And for the sake of time, we won't go into it all, but here's the thing. I came to a point in my salvation when I gave my life to Jesus 
that I knew that I was holding on to this, that this unforgiveness that I, that, that I was holding on to was what was really keeping me from living a life that was full in Jesus. And so I remember at one point I came to my dad. My dad is a hardworking man, blue collar, stoic. This man never cries. And I came to him and, and I didn't even come to him uh, saying uh, that he needs to uh, ask for my forgiveness, but I actually asked him for forgiveness because I realized that through Jesus, I, I realized that he was broken, that he was hurt. That he wasn't just my father, but he was, he was a son to, our, to the Lord we serve, to the God we serve. So I made a decision that moment to say, Dad, would you forgive me for holding you afar? And it was one of the coolest moments because my dad, who I've never seen cry, shed a tear for the first time. I don't think I've ever seen him cry ever since again, but you get the point. Here's the deal. We have a choice to make. You have a decision to make. And I would implore you and I would ask you, pray, talk, discuss, seek the Holy Spirit and say, hey, what does it look like for me, us, we, to live a life where we hold nothing back and we forgive one another. Thank you so much. God bless you.